Welcome to today's CPG Masterclass Series webinar with David Kearney on the Golf in Buddha. First of all, thank you all to, for attending today's webinar. I know some people in the UK, it might be a bank holiday, uh, celebrating VE Day, VE Day. So uh, thank you for attending. And to everybody else on uh, across the continent as well, welcome. Before we do get started, just make sure your microphones are muted, uh, but keep your cameras on if you want to. We'd like to see your faces, see who's involved. Uh, we will be recording this as well, so um, as we upload it, we'll upload it afterwards onto the CPG Masterclass series as with all the other webinars. So if you do miss anything that David um, says or any questions related to it, you can uh, get back on there as well. In terms of the Q&A, we're going to follow a similar structure to what we did yesterday. So I'd like you to just um, private message me any questions that you have just because of the nature of this one in relation to some of the um, relation to mental health. I'd like you to private message just to keep confidentiality, that sort of stuff. And I will make sure that we go through and have a bit of a conversation with David in relation to those. But we will also allocate a bit of time afterwards for, some, for a Q&A as well. Uh, in case you're not aware, my name's Tom Bentley. I am the Communications and Event Manager for the Confederation of Professional Golf. So again, welcome all to this CPG Masterclass Series webinar. Um, and I'll just hand you straight over to David. So he does quite a lot of work with us at the CPG. Um, and is also a volunteer as a counsellor for I Irish Depression and Bipolar Support Group, David? That's correct, Tom. Yep, and, uh, he's gonna, yeah. and he's going to be presenting today on the Golf in Buddha. So, David, I'll hand straight over to you. Super, Tom. Thanks a lot. Lovely to see you all. Um, I hope you're getting ready for a nice weekend, wherever you are, and hope you're all safe and sound. Um, Tom, listen, a quick thank you to yourself and your team for putting on these uh, seminars. It's been great, and... Uh, I think everyone's really enjoyed them. I've got a chance to see a few of them myself, really enjoyed some of the input. How, how have you found it? How have you found the challenge? What's it been like for you personally? I think it's been very good. I mean, you know, when this is obviously a very difficult situation for um, everybody irrespective of golf. So, we, you know, we, we viewed it as a, um, a good opportunity to keep PJ professionals engaged, continue their development and ultimately prepare them for what happens afterwards, whenever that is, depending on where you're from. So... Um, it's been a fantastic opportunity, obviously, for myself, but also for everybody else to uh, continue their own progression. Great. Well, your force is appreciated. Thanks very much for putting it all no, together, because no I know problem. from working with you, it feels, like, uh, it feels like about six months ago we were talking about this time, fl time flew by really quick. So um, let's get started, guys. It's really um, an honor for me to do this and to talk to you all about this. Um, I really enjoyed looking into this space over the last number of years, uh, re really been a kind of a like us all, been on a very specific and individual journey, which we're all on. And, and this has helped me greatly. And I hope in some way that there's somebody or yourself that it can help. And, and uh, if, if there's even one thing you pick out of today's conversation that might be of use, uh, it'll make it all worthwhile. Um, I think it's important at the beginning to differentiate the difference between um, today's conversation, which from my perspective is more of a philosophical overview on things as opposed to a a direct psychological intervention. I'm not a trained or tr psychologist and uh, have worked with some great psychologists in the past. Uh, our own psychologist at the moment within the Ladies Golf Union, Dr. Leanne Sharp, um, who does great work with our 16s. Listen to Brian Hemmings. I've seen Brian speak before a few times. Uh, right back to our own clinical psych, Paul Gaffney and, and, and Chris Blonsdale and people like Carl Morris who I've enjoyed listening to. So uh, we'll go down more the philosophical route if that's okay today and see if any of the sharings are um, of value to you. Uh, what we'll not do is we won't go down a slideshow route, if that's okay, but what I will do at uh, uh, nine individual times is I'll type something into the chat line, which might be of use to you guys uh, going forward. And hopefully uh, what we put in there might give you time to consider the words and, and maybe think about them and listen to um, the context around the words in terms of where we are as golfers or people involved in the golf industry. Um, it goes back a long way, this story. It goes back uh, 2,500, 2,600 years ago. And uh, uh, when I, as I start the conversation today, you know, I'd like to kind of use the opportunity to dedicate it to a very good friend of mine in the U.S. who's struggling a little bit at the moment. And uh, the doc will be listening in later on. And I hope he's well. And I hope he's in a good space when we talk next. The, um, the Buddha landed on the earth. Uh, there's many different ways and terms and stories and ideas of how he got here. And it depends on your persuasion of how you, which story you want to believe. But when uh, text or the ancient Vedas changes script so many times over the years, 
um, it's very hard to know exactly what happened. So in, in true Buddhist fashion, what we'd like to try to do, I think, is to believe which version helps us best. But the rough story of, of what happened was about two and a half thousand years ago, he was born into a world um, of, of plenty, plentifulness. He, it was just incredible. He was born into an ancient ruler, an emperor. They had loads of money. They had loads of staff. They had loads of everything. There was wealth in abundance. And he was into a very, very uh, privileged position which uh, to many, in many degrees would be something that you could stay in and enjoy and, and reap for the rest of your life. But um, Siddhartha chose not to do that. And, and around about the age of 29, after his dad, his mom died young, according to legend, and his, his dad tried to protect him. And this is the first thing that really kind of stoked my interest when I looked into the space was um, the parent tried to project, protect the child uh, by going to such lengths as not letting flowers die in front of him and uh, making sure that nobody who worked at the palace was aged or sick or decrepit and, and really tried to play this game for a long time. Married Siddhartha young, they had a child young and really tried to keep him away from any form of, of life that didn't look like it was ideal. Um, but being the person he was, he, he eventually, uh, curiosity got the better of him and he decided to leave and, and check out the greater world which was an interesting move and a move that would actually go on and really uh, influence a lot of change in the world over the next two and a half thousand years. And one of the first things he noticed when he went out there was that uh, uh, things were extremely different than he thought. There was, there was dying, there was sickness, there was ill health, there was happiness also, there was all sorts going on. And uh, when he saw this, it, it led him to a place where he, he, he really began a, on, a, on his own journey, and his own quest to try to understand uh, what life was about and to try in some ways, um, if, if, if you like, to try and figure it out. I think he, he, at that stage in his life, he pretty much saw himself as an educator and somebody who could contribute uh, in, in, in any way, like we all try to contribute on a daily basis. The interesting journey it took him on took him to 29 years of age, where he spent his first, uh, at 29 years of age, his first uh, attempt was to become what they call an ascetic, which is, uh, basically somebody who deprived themselves of everything at that moment in time. So basically he decided that the way forward was him was to join other ascetics and eat one grain of rice per day and stay away from anything that was considered to be um, a luxury. And, you know, funnily enough, that didn't work for him because uh, very, very simple things like energy, etc. And he, he said, this isn't the way. But he was struggling then at that point because he had a, he had a life of plentifulness and now he had a, a life of nothingness in terms of, in terms of materials and items, and he couldn't figure it out. So that left, left him where we ultimately ended up, which was what he called the middle path or the middle way. And that would be one of the first great lessons from him was the fact that um, somewhere between plentifulness or uh, apparent wealth and, 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 and materials and nothing lies uh, the middle way. And that was something that he was to take with him on his journey. So he became enlightened after six years of, of trying to figure out and, and understand what the world is about. And his sharings with the world were, uh, and, and if, if you like, his ideas on the world were um, very interesting and really, really helpful to a lot of people. So when I started to look at it, I started to look at, at, at the very first one. And it was quite interesting because I'll just type it up as we go. And the first of what he called his uh, noble truths uh, was there will be, there will be suffering that was his first that was his first of his four noble truths so in terms of notes and in terms of what we might try to uh, take a note on today we've got four noble truths and the, the, the first four are really interesting because it was his understanding of the world and his if you like um attempt to try to educate us in how we could see the world and, and, and a way to see the world the middle path if you like when we look at suffering in a golfing context i always think about the teams we deal with and i always think about the players we deal with and Looking back, I always wonder, you know, when we get players involved or we discuss things and work with coaches, with players, you know, is there a formal arrangement at the beginning of this relationship that might lead somebody to understand before we begin that this is not always going to be easy? Is it a natural thing for the human to have to figure this out by themselves? Um, is it something that we should talk a little bit more about to our younger golfers? Is it, is it, is it a sit-down conversation to say, you know what, that we might actually improve, but this could take different paths. And I think that some of my own experiences as a national coach have been really interesting for me to uh, share some time with players 
um, when that uh, suffering has happened in terms of their performance. Um, we can all look at the greater, the, the greater context of suffering in terms of life, but in terms of a golfing sense, whether it comes from malperformance or whether it comes from any of us that have struggled in the past with our jobs or with anything like that, the context around that first noble truth is really important for us to understand. He very quickly followed up with a, an interesting second noble truth, um, which essentially was, you know, and I'll write it again, there is a cause. So essentially number two was that there was, there was going to, there's a cause to this suffering and that if we understand the cause, there's a possibility and a great chance that this suffering might be alleviated. So I was really interested when I got to line two because I was really, really keen to find out what this cause was so I could stop it for myself personally. And, you know, I think the, the, the interesting thing about when we look at cause is in, in, in most of the stuff that I've read, it generally comes down to craving, it comes down to desire, and it comes down to a very simple fundamental of um, the world being X and you wanting it to be Y. Um, your day going in A direction, you wanting it to go in B direction. So essentially, he educated us into a manner of an ability to be able to sit with the actuality of what the state was, as opposed to uh, trying to change it and trying to understand how it could change. The next piece, which was great news, um, was that this will end. So essentially, there was going to be a cessation to the suffering at some point. And how this would end would be through the Eightfold Path. So there are the first four ones, guys, our first four noble truths, that life is suffering. Uh, there's a cause to this suffering, uh, namely crazy, craving, desire. Um, the good news is it will end, and the best way for it to end is to follow the Eightfold Path, which he devised over his many years on the Gangetic Plain, with uh, all of his followers and all of his, um, all of his friends. So when we move into that space and we, 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 we find the middle path and understand um, that that is what life may be like and can be life, it can be like, it leads us to our first, uh, our first context and that would be his eightfold path, which in terms of what it actually is, it's, it's eight contextualized words the first of which is right understanding. So what he asked all, all of us to do was to try to understand essentially as we begin the rules of the game. So the rules of the game were, were as above the Four Noble Truths and for our view and our understanding on life and our ability to be able to see it as is, understand what's happening um, and that it wasn't always going to go in a certain direction and that it wasn't always perfect. That could be really, really helpful. So when, when, we, look at, when we look at right understanding and, and you know, we, we, we think about understanding that there will be suffering goes back to some, some dealings we've had with players. I remember a player a couple of years ago and, and, and she didn't get selected for the European uh, Championships team and she called me and she said she wanted to speak to me and we had a really good conversation around, um, r around the, the situation and it was her understanding, um, I think eventually they got her to a place where she's an excellent player now because essentially preceding that conversation we did have a conversation around the fact that things weren't always going to go in a good in a, in, a, in, a, in a similar direction all the time as golfers so something like that can be really helpful and I think when we when we lead ourselves into that understanding piece if we understand life as such that it's not all going to be 100% perfect and um, that it's somewhere between indulgence and depravity I think we'll be okay the rules uh in terms of where we are right now and the understanding we have in this current time, um, I think a lot of the difficulties are, difficulties are around uncertainty and um, uh, the impermanence. And really that's the big issue in terms of, of where we are right now is we don't know what's going to happen, which can be as big as an effect of actually what is currently happening. Um, his second on his eightfold path was right intention. And right intent, and that was, uh, for us as humans, for us as players, to think about uh, our intent on a daily basis. What do we intend to do? Because ultimately, um, if you can look at this in a couple of different ways, but as busy practitioners, we can also look at it, look at it through some of uh, Greg McKeown's work, um, his book, Essentialism. We can look at what's my intention today? What am I trying to achieve today? Because one of the things we struggle with consistently, and a lot of our uh, callers into aware would struggle with, is the fact that ultimately at the end of the day we govern our own intentions only 
And while sometimes we feel we may control others, um, we actually don't. So our second on our, on our Eightfold Path was our own intent and our right intent. So, you know, being right and, and being correct is, 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 is really something that might not be that useful, whereas your intention could be extremely useful. And the Buddha specifically wanted intention. He looked at intention uh, and your intention, was it through anger or greed? Was it through love or craving? Um, in some of our cases, sometimes our intention is through perfection of craft. So what's our intent on a daily basis would be uh, Eightfold Path number two and a really interesting one to look at your own intent. Number three is quite interesting. And number three was how we conduct ourselves through right speech. And right speech is very broad, very different. Um, from a golfing perspective, all this, this might sound a little bit fuzzy. Um, I know in Ireland, uh, Neil and myself and, and all the players, we would put high value on the way the players speak to um, people when we travel and speak to each other. Um, but there's also the internal speech in terms of uh, how you're speaking to yourself. And, and with, our, with the, the patients we work with, sometimes what we have is an internal chatter that can be quite difficult. Uh, best expressed maybe in uh, Timothy Galloway's great book, The Inner Game of Golf, but it's the, your thought process and your thought pattern, which sometimes um, with some of the, the, the callers into aware can be getting to a very high level of anxiety. So essentially your thought pattern is running uh, very, on, a, on a very different bandwidth than yourself, and it's very hard to temper and control the two. So internal speech and external speech would be um, extremely, import, extremely important. And direct speech, I suppose, when you look at uh, uh, Jordan B. Peterson's work and we look at you know, his, his, his 12 rules of life and we look at tell the truth or at least try not to lie, um, accurate speech, I think the players find accurate speech really, really helpful as opposed to um, woolly speech. Why was I not selected? Um, well, here's the facts of why you were not selected so you can improve as opposed to any mention of any other players, any mention of, of stuff that you're uh, not good at more objective, correct speech to help the player develop and move forward. Uh, right action was our next one. And right action in its purest sense is after we have decided to um, engage is, is what does that action mean and what is that action like? I mean, it's obviously very relevant to uh, coaches and players. What action are we taking? Um, you know, the, in, in its purest sense, the right action from the Buddhist perspective was to do with uh, the five precepts on misconduct, harm, et cetera, et cetera. But from our perception as coaches, again, going back to, for me, one of the pillars of being a very good coach or a very good player would be that the coach or the player was consistently engaging uh, in what they felt was the right action. That, to me, would be hugely important, and I value that greatly. Um, we're coming up to right livelihood, uh, which I think is very important. And we look at we look at coaches, and we look at um, people involved in the golf industry all the time. And we all are making a living. Very interested me in Peak's uh, conversation last week about um, the why, um, his his essential shout and call to arms to use this point about what that livelihood livelihood might be. If there's something you are very interested in, something you really enjoy, um, something you think makes you happier. Um, well, then perhaps, uh, as, as, as Bob Buford would say in his book, Path Time, maybe a slow movement more over towards more of that type of work would be, would be uh, something that the Buddha would, would have valued greatly. Although the context he spoke in right livelihood at the time was more around that we don't, um, we don't gain by uh, ill-gotten gains and by greed and by, by theft, etc. So another area I think that right livelihood is really important, uh, two spaces here, I think from a lot of us working around the space of where some players are interested in joining, in joining the professional game, um, need to be really careful with that because I think the experience we have is that for some that might be right livelihood and for others it might not be for many, many different reasons and not just for the fact of the alleged quality of their game at that time. The, I, the biggest change for me in my generation is that the, to work with so many great young people who at this point may have a choice in their livelihood as opposed to um, maybe in the previous generation where it was about getting a, a good job and making sure you had a good job. It's very different now and, and life is extremely different in terms of that livelihood. In terms of uh, professional golf, from Ireland's perspective, we're just experiencing our first uh, situation where we have two girls on the LPGA Tour, Leona Maguire and Stephanie Meadow. And that's been an incredible journey, but, but 
I'm very proud to say, uh, talking to you guys now, is that you've got two girls involved there in Right Livelihood. They're girls who, um, you know, jump out of bed in the morning wanting to play top quality golf, and there's no question mark. And um, from my perspective, even though I'm not privy to all of the posts, but there's no question mark that they're not involved in Right Livelihood. And conversely, we have a couple of excellent uh, amateur players, Chloe Ryan, Paula Grant, who've gone down the educational route and, and, and achieved um, magnificent qualifications at school and gone on to work in the areas of law and optometry. So like, livelihood can be important in terms of dealing with your players at that level who, uh, who maybe aspire to a professional game. And we need a deeper dive with those guys to figure out what that might be. Uh, right effort is the next one. And right effort is interesting. And for me, right effort uh, is linked with 100% with intention. Uh, I think this is a huge, uh, from a golfing perspective, if we look at right effort, uh, players are sometimes maybe suggested to that they're not putting in enough effort. But if their intention is not to be um, a world-class player, maybe their effort is actually um, absolutely perfect for the level of golf they want to play. So. Uh, for what I've tried to do in terms of right speech is instead of bandying around accusations of people not working hard enough, I've tried to maybe discuss with the player a little bit more about how right effort and right intention could match up really well and how we could think about the two of them being uh, bedfellows, as it were. So I think that's a really, uh, really important one for me is the, the, the right effort, but not as a standalone, something that sits in with right intention. And we're on to our last two, which would be the uh, two of what he would call more of the meditative um, eightfold paths, and they would be mindfulness and concentration. And there's a slight difference, I think, from my perspective on them. Um, but if I write them down for you, we can discuss them a little bit. If I can spell it properly, that'd be a help. There we go. Um, boom. So, right, mindfulness and right concentration. I mean, mindfulness is a word that's really interesting. It's been popped around. Um, all over the world for the last few years in particular, you can't go into a bookshop now, but for seeing um, many, many different books on mindfulness. Um, but essentially, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's the art of paying, paying attention to the daily spaces we're in. Um, in terms of where anyone might be in terms of uh, having, having, having difficulties and having worries, and in particular with so many of us now, um, who have caused to be concerned and worried a little bit about whether um, our loved ones are, are in trouble from a health perspective or ourselves or some people around us might have a, a, an insecure financial future. It's very easy to be worried. But in fact, if we look more closely, most of, most of the stuff a lot of us are worried about hasn't actually happened yet. So it's really important to understand that the mindful space is about um, being where you are as opposed to worrying about where you might be. And that's a common is the default human position really is to be in that space because that's how we survived the savannah many years ago. But and I understand it, but I'm very happy to uh, put that out to, for anyone to think about a little bit more to help them through this time if they are going through any situation where worry and anxiety might be overpowering them a little bit sometimes. Um, I have a lovely piece I just came across this morning. Um, they explain mindfulness in my journal. They explain mindfulness really well to me, so I'll just take a moment to read it out if that's okay. And it's by a writer that I'm going to recommend in the reading list afterwards, who's an excellent writer and probably, um, in many ways, the person that popularized mindfulness in the U.S. Mindfulness is an ancient practice which has profound relevance for our present day lives. The relevance has nothing to do with Buddhism per se, or with becoming a Buddhist, but it has everything to do with waking up and living in harmony with oneself and the world. It has to do with examining who we are, with questioning our view of the world and our place in it and cultivating some appreciation for the fullness of each moment we are alive. Most of all, it has to do with being in touch. And that's from John Kabat-Zinn, um, who's the incredible guy. And I'll give you his name afterwards if you'd like to look into him a little bit more. I've really enjoyed his stuff. Um, my last piece is right concentration. And this has been really good. Um, read some really good stuff on this in the last while. And uh, I think the biggest, uh, issue we might have on concentration in terms of when we combine mindfulness and con concentration is this guy doesn't probably help a lot and um, probably causing us all some issues on a daily basis and right concentration um, could be one of those things that can be affected by distraction and by where our attention is. Um, interesting one 
probably a couple of good spaces to look on this one. We'd have uh, Rasmus Hogard, not the Danish golfer, but the Danish uh, leader of the Potential Project, who have enjoyed some of his stuff. Cal Newport, Digital Minimalism, very good in terms of controlling um, all of the accessible tools we have in current day life. And about you being in charge and you get, getting the best out of those um, and understanding what you enjoy, uh, whether it's uh, social media, whether it's interaction on WhatsApp groups, whether it's emails, whether it's reading, uh, whether it's phone calls and not being apologetic to anybody because you're not interested in one and very interested in the other, but figuring out which um, helps you on a daily basis to lead your life. I think when we look at concentration as well, the other thing we've discussed a lot as players um, and coaches is our concentration in terms of as between play and between practice. It's really interesting, something that probably over the years working with some teams and working with players um, that has led me to a space where I've enjoyed conversations where the players probably would suggest to me that they're very, very two different levels of concentration. Uh, and I firmly believe through, uh, through uh, what I've read that the amount of practice and play that you can do in terms of the same concentration and the same mindset um, could be equally benefit, could be very beneficial. So one of the ways we've uh, spoken to players about this is you imagine, you know, your play and your tournament and where you are in that sense is a very kind of a high pitched effort. And then you imagine your practice as kind of low pitch and maybe listening to some music or talking to some pals or doing something different. And one of the things we've, we've attempted to do is to try to meet um, those two areas of arousal a little bit more in the middle so that the human can be a little bit more constant in their interactions and understand themselves a little bit better. And that's something I'd like to feed back to the group today as being very useful and, and in many ways from player feedback uh, to me very effective. So, uh, I think we have uh, hopefully 12 nice pieces uh, for you to think about. Um, we have uh, the Four Noble Truths and we have the Eightfold Path. So nice and simple to bite off, um, nice and uh, uh, easy to understand, hopefully in terms of the fact that they're all actions that we can take responsibility for as opposed to outsourcing the responsibility to somebody else. Uh, and we can look after and govern and tend our own gardens, if you like. Um, I think one of the important things for us is in terms of, in terms of how we develop and how we keep um, moving forward in the golfing world is for it's a personal responsibility piece as opposed to a, a collective in many ways. Um, and I'm very happy to, to have shared today's conversation with you in the hope that it might help. Um, I'm just going to show you one thing before I finish up. Um, Tom, I'm going to just pop, pop up a reading list here if I can, okay? Yeah, sure. That's no problem, David. He says if he can, showing my level of computer savviness. <laughs> okay, so here we go. Yeah, so we got a couple of uh, real zingers there um, all the way through. And, and basically those books, when I was trying to write uh, and put across my right, right action, right effort today, um, whenever I was writing something down and taking some notes, these are the books that kind of popped into my head as, as being something I've learned that maybe has led me to a space where, uh, despite my own challenges over the years, I'm able to uh, attempt to help everybody today. Um, so they're all, uh, for many, many different reasons, um, have been a great influence and a great help. And I think with any reading list we get, uh, it's important maybe to to uh, drill down a little bit more, be more specific to where you are, and perhaps find one or two that might suit you and be in your space at the moment. An example of such where uh, Life Lessons by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross would be excellent for anybody uh, who I'm feeling for at the moment that might have experienced any kind of a connected death at this point um, in, in COVID-19. Um, very important at the bottom is uh, my email address, and that's there as a genuine um, address to anyone who uh, confidentially or otherwise wants to write and wants to talk at any point. I'm extremely happy to listen, um, extremely happen to, happy to help or share and, and recommend whatever I can or, or just be part of, 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 of some, some process. That's no problem at all. You can write to me at any point. Um, 
my own um i suppose my own journey leads me not to be in a space where i enjoy very much social media so you're more likely to get me on that uh, email address than you would do anywhere else so um it's been lovely to talk to you i hope you might have found one or two things of use today um i wish you all very well um tom i don't know if you if you have any questions that we need to pop through as we come towards yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, as I said at the start, if you do have questions for me that may be more personal towards yourself, just private message me them now and I'll, I'll uh, go through them. We'll obviously keep it confidential, but any generic questions that you think is more relevant to everybody, post them in the chat as well. I think I'll just start one question off. Um, sure. Just interested to see with some of the principles that you've spoken about today, mm -hmm. how has that influenced your own... Um, teaching methods i suppose or own um, philosophies around coaching and golf and the way you work with your students yeah it's a brilliant question it's been a, it's been it's been great tom um I, I suppose when i look at my own dna i'm from a big family and essentially uh, i i my, something i had in my head was that pretty much everything was somebody else's fault and uh, even into my 20s if somebody else was successful I didn't enjoy their success struggled a lot struggled a lot with that um, was very vulnerable around that space and um, really kind of how would I describe it best was I, I didn't when I looked in the mirror I didn't particularly like that process so I knew I had to work on it and I knew I had to understand it a little bit more so essentially um, and it's amazing the way that thing, things um, stick with you as you go through your life but um, I th I'm nearly sure I saw Howard Bennett on this call there when I was opening up. And if I did a big hello to Howard, it's lovely to see Howard, um, who's been a huge influence and probably one of the reasons I'm a professional golfer, if not the reason. But um, I was just thinking about my life there, which brought Howard into my head. But I suppose I was at a conference one day, Tom, and sometimes we can learn things. And But yet it's one sentence that pulled the whole thing together. And there was a guy called David Smith from Diageo. Yep. And he was, the, he was a guy from Leeds. I believe he was from Leeds. Somewhere up your neck, neck of the woods anyway. A good Yorkshire man or somewhere like that. <laughs> and uh, I remember him doing a very, very good presentation. And I remember him saying that even though he had all the responsibility he had, that it was about putting the two feet on the floor and really just getting into the day. And around about that time, and around about the time, I read a lot of John Kabat-Zinn's work. And it hadn't come together. So I can join the dots backwards, as Steve Jobs would say. But I remember thinking, right, if I can somehow manage to look at, right, a better understanding of what life is. So in other words, I probably grew up in a really, really happy childhood where there was very little suffering. So I didn't really understand that things weren't going to go perfect. And then at that point where I realized, you know what, if I can look at these four things, get a fundamental understanding of life. And then if I can look at these eight through things and try, and I say try because we're humans, we don't do what we want to do all the time. But if I can try to nail these eight things on a daily basis, let me see what will happen. And actually, to be brutally frank about it, by trying to do that, everything to a large degree began to sort itself out. Yeah. Whereas my previous attempt with my, you know, previous attempt was to be controlling or to be in a position where, you know, I was batting away negativity as opposed to just being myself and trying to do my best. So I, when I go to the lesson team now and work with a player, um, this stuff comes up in my head all the time, right action, right mindfulness. Am I there with them? Am I concentrated on them? Uh, how's my speech? And sometimes that speech might need to be uh, tell the truth or at least don't tell a lie, as Jordan Peterson says. I need to be a bit more direct because sometimes I can dress things up a little bit. And sometimes, yeah. and sometimes that's not helpful for the player at all. So that might, be, uh, that might be something, and I might be a bit slow with this stuff, but physically I, would, physically I would read these often and just realign and reboot and make sure that I'm in the space that I think I can live my life best. Okay, cool. I, I want to flip that then onto the student sort of perspective of it in terms of I sort of just, it's, it's, it's probably stereotyping a little bit, but you think yeah. about um, sort of my generation who maybe gone through the 90s and the early who were very technologically driven and all these different influences that are coming from them, uh, from different sources. Is this something that actually you strip back those um, influences and you focus on these principles can enrich people's lack? It's sort of hard to explain in that mm -hmm. there's a lot of distractions that younger people are going through as a student. If you were to teach this and to not necessarily enforce it, but 
to get people to read about it and learn about it could be very beneficial from the students' learning point of view. Yeah, hugely. Uh, was it was it Harvey Penick when the when the student is ready, the teacher appears? I know that when I got my first copy of Wherever You Go, There You Are, Neil and I, Neil Manship and I were on a golf trip, and a priest gave it to me, and I, I thought I thought he was I, I thought he was hallucinating. I didn't need that book. Everything was perfect. I wasn't ready at that time to to relook at the way that I was doing things. And I think it's the same with many of our students. So our best job with our students is just a careful moment to say, I'm here. Um, how do you feel? What do you need from me? Um, we could discuss a few of these things, you know, and get in touch if you need me. But it's that openness without, uh, I think there's nothing worse than, than insisting that people listen to stuff like this because I think that's, it's not going to go in. It's like if you said to everybody, you have to be on the call on Friday. Um, it, it doesn't work that way. So what I'm inclined to do, if I can use my radar to maybe see a young me or to see somebody who might be struggling a little bit, um, Tom, I might just try and use some good questioning to maybe open up a conversation. And if I can open up that conversation, I think right action then is to support and continue to support. So I think it's the underpin for me of, of most things that, and some kids are great. Some kids just fly through life and they don't, they don't need or look at any of this and that's fine, but I wasn't one of those. Yeah. Okay. No problem. Thank you for that. A um, couple of questions that have come in. One, um, any exercises that you do with the Irish team to help control their attention um, in, co in competition, I suppose, in lessons as well? Yeah, very good. So we've had uh, Donald Scott, our ladies coach, is a, a, a superb human being. And Donald and I would have been battering away with this type of stuff over the years, having really good conversations that were super important to both Donald and I at the time and probably nobody else. I'd love to have taped a few of them, but... Um, Donald introduced some meditation uh, and breathing exercises on our form of the training camp a year and a half ago. And that was the first time we tried it in-house. And it was excellent. It went really well. The girls really enjoyed it. And we tried to extend and expand the conversation into the fact that, I suppose, from a golfing parlance, Tom, it would be, we have one four two uphill into the breeze, bunker on the right, pin on the left. You know, the fact of whether you're seven under or seven over, um, that's your thought pattern. That's self too. That actually doesn't matter. Can you be there? Can you be mindful? Can you be present? Can you be with the shot? And can you let it be? And that was really something we started with. And like everything else, I would say that we would again offer those services to the girls in terms of if anyone wants to expand their thoughts. I would have two of the girls now that would uh, converse with me regularly on this type of stuff. And conversely, I would have five that don't. Yeah. So it's quite of our top panel. So it's really up to a menu of where the athlete thinks, you know what, I think I'll access this because I think it might help. And if that's S and C for somebody or um some some eightfold path work with somebody else, that's great. Yep. Okay. Um very good question here. Uh with your knowledge of the Buddha, do you think yeah. in a situation if he turned his hand to golf coaching, would he be more of an instructive coach or collaborative? I think he'd be a quiet coach. I don't think his lesson book would be busy at all. I think it'd be very <laughs> interesting. I think it'd be very interesting to see him in action. Absolutely. But I think my learnings from it would be that um, it would be middle middle way, middle path based. I think there would be. I mean, I remember my first um, exposure to guided discovery or even self discovery. Like I didn't even know what that was. I was already a coach. I had no idea. And then as soon as I knew what it was, I knew, okay, that's just a name for it. Because when I grew up in the West of Ireland, it was all self-discovery or guided discovery. So it was very little dictative uh, teaching. So you've caught me on with that question. It's a great question. So my answer to it is, I think he would be wise enough to know what right action was. Okay. I think that I think that brings some sort of relevance to applying your coaching skills and understandings to the individual as well. Then, in that it's not just necessarily um, instructive all the time. You adapt it to the person that's in front of you and that sort of thing. It's a lovely one, and I like to get my own. In my own head, it's it's changing gears because it, especially when we come back out of out of when nobody's been playing golf. Um, I'm 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 guessing that some of the people that have the interest to go and look at something like this are interested and excellent coaches. Um, so, you know, an excellent coach, something I've been uh, keen to listen to is the fact that an excellent coach over the years is not just a coach that coaches excellent players. 
it's somebody who gets people involved and with the work we've done with you guys at CPG it's somebody who gets people involved uh, and enjoying the game so when we go back out there um, you know it's, it's a huge amount of uh, my colleague Marie Jeffrey did a lovely piece on communication it's a huge amount of pacing leading it's a huge amount of getting that person into a space where they feel really comfortable and safe and enjoy enjoying the moment of being in a golf lesson or being in a golf environment. Uh, Chuck Hogan stood up on the stage in Malmo in 2003 and walked around the stage like a lunatic for the first hour shouting, they just want to be safe. They just want to be safe. And you know, at the time the place was up in arms. They said, we've paid all this money and this guy's just shouting, they want to be safe. But here I am 18 years later and I'm beginning to figure out what he's talking about. So <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think if we can change gear, if we can go and be what we need to be as the leaders of the game for the person that's in front of us and ensure, you know, I hear a lot of, I, I hear a lot of things, you know, I only do this lesson. I only, I char- you know, if we're agile, it's going to make the experience so much more enjoyable for people around us. Okay. I'd like to finish on one more. Um, yeah. In terms of this current situation that we're in, um, yes. with probably some people not perhaps working or people <coughs> preparing to get back to work, etc. Now, I know with some of the principles you've spoken to don't detract from one another. They're as important as, as the next. But if you could give a little bit of advice to, or one piece of advice from the Buddha's teachings to each of our listeners today, what would that be in relation to the current situation? Um, you know what? It's... it's uh... It's one, believe it or not, my, my preparation for this actually was probably the last uh, 48 years, but my preparation for this specifically this week, something happened yesterday, which I thought was really cool and I really liked. And that was a guy called uh, Jack Cornfield. Uh, and Jack Cornfield's a, a very eminent meditation teacher, but he changed my mind on a word yesterday and he changed the word from patience to constancy. So, you know, if anybody, um, guys, um, and huge respect to anyone who's listening to this in their second language, because I couldn't even attempt to do that. But patience, and we talk about patience in golf, and we talk about being patient. But Cornfield's idea on patience was that, okay, if you're patient, that's fine, but you're assuming something is going to happen later. So in other words, we're all patient now, because we assume we're going to open up and go back to doing something that we've been used to doing in a month or a week or whatever. So he asked us to change the word to constancy and constancy really leads in a position where we're here and we're not here for a particular reason. We're not here because something may or may not happen. We're just here. So what I would do is I would try uh, and actually the, the, some of the guys I, I went to school with and some of my own brothers, they, they won't be watching this, but they, they can't, understand how i can do this now because i would have been the archetypical antichrist when it came to behaving like this i would want everything organized i would want my lesson book for the first week in july full and i would want certainty and permanence when actually all we ever have is uncertainty and yeah. impermanence so yeah. it's how you can meet those two imposters um, with the same open arms have a breath and just watch life go by and having said that at the same time just to temper that um, Tom, I'm quite ambitious in terms of my work. I love my work. I try to do well at it. So I'm not, I'm not lying back saying it'll be what it'll be. But in my own mind, I'm aggressively mindful and conscious of doing what I can do right now as opposed to um, what will happen going back to work whenever that'll be because we don't know. So is there any point in actually starting to deal with that if we don't know what it is? I think it's, it's, a very, it's, a, sorry, it's a very tricky balancing act between those two, isn't it, really? Ultimately, I think that's a very good point. Yeah, but it, it, and I, all I can say for anyone that thinks, you know, for me, that is a learned skill. And that is, you know, we're only 20 years from when people suggested that the brain, the, the brain was X and then you couldn't change it. But now we know through this neuroplasticity and this work that we can just, we can learn and we can change and we can grow. So a shout out to anyone who, at all feels anxious or, or uncomfortable in this space and uh, support for them at this time, for sure. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. What I would say um, in respect to just finally, you know, David's uh, left his email on the screen there as well. So, uh, David, I'm sure you're you okay with people perhaps emailing you directly if they've got any specific help or questions for it, that. 
it it would be my preferred contribution, Tom, because everybody's so different that you might get something that might be very specific. And if I can help at all, um, it's something I enjoy doing. So it's absolutely no uh, no trouble. And um, it might might mean a follow up call later on. And I can tell you one thing: I know I'm in Ireland. I know exactly where I'm going to be for the next number of weeks. And it's not <laughs> outside, so I have capacity as well. So I look forward to reaching out and talking to anybody who wanted to have a conversation. That's brilliant. So there you go, guys. Um, if you do have a question or I'll come on a conversation with David, there's his contact below. Um, first, finally, just want to finish off just by saying thank you to everybody. Um, obviously, it's um, still a very challenging time, depending on which countries you're in, etc. But um, the engagement has been fantastic from all of you. And, we've, and uh, we really look forward to seeing you on the next ones. Just in relation to that, uh, we've got um, five next week webinars, uh, one with Ian Peake, which is the part two of his professional why. So very similar sort of field and area that he'll be talking about. And it was um, a very interesting webinar the first time with him. So that's on Monday. Then Tuesday, it's personal development with Russell Warner. Wednesday, uh, adaptive golf and uh, how that can benefit your business from a financial point of view with Todd Kirstead. Thursday, um, it's a mar sort of a macro marketing, destination marketing style webinar with a colleague of mine called Ryan um, on uh, with tourism, which will be really interesting. Um, and then finally, building a community of female golfers with Alistair Spink, um, who's obviously um, an interesting and very knowledgeable guy as well. So hopefully we can see you at some of those. And then finally, just to tie off, I'd like to say thank you to you, David. That was really, really fascinating. Um, something that we don't often uh, think about day to day. Um, I, I'm very guilty of it myself. So um, just to get to hear your thoughts and um, expertise on that was, was really interesting thanks for everything you do tom and i appreciate it and you're not guilty of anything we're not judging <laughs> thank you and as Take i care. say as i say we've got this recorded as well so if you do if you did want to go back onto it we'll put it onto the hub page as soon as possible so once again thank you all so much for attending and uh, have a great evening thanks tom thanks for everything thank you david Cheers.